feet and daylight unto my path. Welcome to Searchlight, a survey through Scripture with Pastor John Corson. It is our desire to bring you a systematic study of the entire Bible, chapter by chapter, book by book. Do you wish God would speak to you more specifically about situations in your life? This is the question that Pastor John is addressing here on Searchlight as we're traveling through Genesis chapters 7 and 8. In this story, we see that Noah didn't hear from the Lord for a long time. Why not? Did God forget him? Do you feel like God forgets you? Let's now join Pastor John as he is looking at some verses in Romans chapter 5 that shed some light on these questions. But we glory in tribulation, storms, hard stuff, troubling times, difficult days. We glory in tribulation. Why? Why would you glory when you're in a barge, when you're on the ark, when you're not hearing what's next, when you don't know what's going on? Why would you glory? Because, Paul says, we don't just glory in our position and our access. We also glory in problems. We celebrate them. Why? Because glorying in tribulations, knowing that tribulation works what? Read that. Tribulation works what? You know what you learn, folks? You're on the ark. You're bobbing around. You wonder, God, are you there? Do you care? But you know, there's nothing you can do about the situation except learn to be patient. Tribulation works patience. Verse 4. Then patience works experience. What's that? When I finally settle down, when I finally let go and let God, when I finally quit squawking, (laughs) and I just say, whatever, Lord, I give up. I don't know what's happening. I don't know what you're doing. God says, good, now you're getting it. Because tribulation works in patience, and patience works experience. You start to now gain some experiences because you see how when you let go and let God, when you finally give up, how God moves in. This retreat center behind us. What a story. I was there at the county hearings. We were arguing for a new sanctuary. And the planning commission there was not very favorable to our, to our plan for a new sanctuary. Right before we presented our plan, it was not looking good. The Buddhists from Ashland came and they were desiring to build a 12-bed retreat center in Ashland. And they were up right before us on the docket, and they get up and do their thing, and the planning guys say, no, it's not going to you know, be, be possible to do that. And then their lawyer says, well, what about Applegate Christian Fellowship? They have a 120-bed retreat center behind their sanctuary, and they have the same zoning that we as the Buddhist group do. And these guys, these commissioners looked at each other. They have what out there? <laughs> they have a 120-bed retreat center functioning. And an amazing thing happened as we were sitting there. We heard the rest of the story, and that was that these planning guys were unaware of that because, you see, when meetings were called to make that determination, Those guys didn't show up, and it was left up then to the staff guy, one guy hired by the county to make those decisions when none of the staff guys show up or or come to a given meeting. And these guys couldn't believe it. And the staff guy stands up, and he says, I called three different meetings, and, and no one came. And so the 
rules are that when no one comes, <clears throat> it's left up to me, and I approved it. <laughs> and these Buddhists were there, you know, and, and, the, and the planning guys were looking around, and it was, it was an amazing moment. And we were sitting there, and we were going, wow, awesome. We didn't know this, see. And I thought, man, Lord, you know, here I am, you know, squawking and complaining about you know, county stuff and reading stories like I started out with them this night and all the rest. And and Lord, yet you just came through in ways that only now I see you were at work all the time, blinding eyes and making people not show up to meetings and causing it all to work out. Lord, you're awesome. And how often we've seen that happen in all of our lives individually and as a church corporately. You know, where they're complaining and things aren't going right and frustration builds up and I get perturbed. And then you say, oh, wow, look what you did, Lord. See, tribulation works patience. And when you finally calm down, when I finally settle down, then I begin to get experiences. I begin to see, yeah, yeah, how God does work. Now go on with me. Tribulation works patience. Patience, patience gives you experience. Experience gives you what? Hope. And you know what the biblical definition of the word hope is. It's not, oh, I hope it works out. Hope in the Bible. If you don't know this, get this. The word hope in the Bible means the absolute expectation of coming good. You're absolutely certain that good is coming. Hope. It's not, oh, I hope something. You Hope. I know good is coming down the pike. I know good is right around the bend. I know good is heading my way. Now watch this last phrase. Tribulation brings about patience. You just finally have to give up. Patience gives you experiences because you see how God does then come through. Experience gives you hope. Then you start to learn, because of the experiences you've had, hey, good will be happening. So experience gives you hope. And hope, watch this next phrase, verse 5, hope makes not what? Ashamed. I've walked with the Lord for lots of years now. And I'll tell you this. In my own walk, the things I'm ashamed of The things I've said, the feelings I've had, the actions I've done that I'm ashamed of. Attitudes, activities, behavior, mentalities. The things I'm ashamed of all are linked directly to a loss of hope. Where you get to the place and you say, Oh, man, this is not going to work out. Or, oh, boy, why continue on? Or, oh, hey, what's the use? And that leads you into doing things, saying things, feeling things that you will ultimately be ashamed of. The things that you've done, I think if you think it through, that you're ashamed of today are linked to times when you were hopeless. You thought, oh, what's the use? You know, why even bother? Why try so hard to walk the straight and narrow? Look at the situation I'm in. Whatever it is that people do that later on they're ashamed of, it always relates to hopelessness. And now I begin to understand something. Lord, you're right. That's why tribulation is necessary. Because it makes me finally give up in the sense of, I just let you do whatever you want to. I'm not steering the ark any longer. I'm not calling the shots anymore. I'm not the captain of my destiny like I thought I was previously. Lord, this tribulation just forces me to be patient. I've just got to trust you. I can't do anything any longer. And patience gives me Some experiences. I see how God comes through. And experience gives me hope. Yeah, look at what the Lord has done. And I know he's going to keep on coming through. And hope makes me not ashamed. In our next study, we're going to see how Noah evidently lost hope and does something that he's very ashamed of. 
God is saying to you and me, I haven't forgotten you. But you see, the only way that you're going to not be ashamed in this life and throughout eternity is if you have faith. And faith is not faith if you know what I'm doing. Faith is not faith if you know where it's going. Faith is not faith if you can figure out why it's happening. Faith is not faith if you understand exactly what's going on. Job, 38 chapters, he's wondering, he's arguing, he's questioning. 38 chapters, he's debating with his friends as he sits there on a hill of dung. Opening up his boils with pus running out. Broken pottery in his hand, opening up and lancing boils, you see. His kids are dead. His property has been taken over. His barns are burned down. He's sick physically. Everything is taken away but his wife. (laughs) You know the story. The devil left her. (laughs) Because she was the one that said, Ah, Job, forget it. It's hopeless. It's hopeless, Job. Just curse God and die. Great wife. (laughs) Your best bet, honey, is just to curse God and kill yourself. Hopelessness. And Job wonders what's going on. Oh, he, he worships the Lord initially, but you begin to hear in his voice some loss of ground as the story unfolds. And then in chapter 38, 39, 40, God comes on the scene and God says, Job, who are you that darkens counsel with sayings that you don't understand. Where were you, Job, when I laid the foundations of the world? You don't really know what you're talking about in your philosophical discussion. Job, I'm God, you're not. And then God was essentially saying, would you trust me? And Job goes down as a great man. Sure, he wavered a bit, and sure, he was on shaky ground for a while, perhaps. But he never did curse God. He never did walk away. And if I don't get this, if I don't see this, I'm in trouble. That is, in this ark called salvation, we're sailing towards heaven. It's not about me understanding everything here and now. It's a matter of me getting faith for... Listen, it's a matter of me getting faith... Listen, it's a matter of gaining faith for eternity. This is daily doubles for you football players. This is boot camp for you ex-Marine Corps guys and soldiers. This is spring training for you baseball fans. This life is simply preparing me for what's going to last forever and ever and ever, this thing called heaven. And the lingua franca of heaven is faith. The language of heaven, the language of eternity is faith. When that finally sinks in, when I finally understand, got it, Lord, this whole journey that we're on is to prepare us for eternity. And you see that in eternity, faith is going to be necessary to serve you and to be used by you and to really go through eternity to its fullest possible degree Faith, I've got to learn the language of faith. And that only comes when you are in the ark and you don't know what's going on. I wish there was an easier way to learn faith and hope. There isn't. I wish there was an easier way to be prepared for heaven. There isn't. So John, what do we do in the meantime? Well, look at our verse. Look and see what happened with Noah. He's there for 190 days, in a sense, in the dark. And God remembered Noah, verse 1 of chapter 8, and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. Please understand, you students of the Bible, the language here isn't God, oh, hey, Noah, forgot all about him. Oh, yeah, 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 I remember. Yeah, oh, sorry, buddy. It's not that at all. It's not God snapping his fingers and saying, Oh, yeah, Noah. 
The idea is, and God continually, constantly was remembering Noah. Even though Noah was in the dark, if you would, bouncing around in the ark. God remembers constantly. Although he's not chattering away, although Noah must be wondering, God remembers constantly. This is the key. If I can say one thing tonight that will help you and help me in times when we're bobbing around on the barge and maybe on the verge of despair. God remembered Noah. And I'll tell you where I get it, where I understand it, where it all becomes clear to me once again. I remember truly that God remembers me when I do what Jesus asked of you and asked of me. He said, do this in remembrance of me. Remember who I am. When you come to the table, that's why we serve communion here every morning, every day, many evenings, constantly. The Eucharistic table, I go to the table and I sit there or I kneel down in front of the table and I hold in my hands the broken body of Jesus and the shed blood and I say, oh Lord, I remember what you've done for me. And I remember now how much you're in love with me. And although I might not understand what's going on, Lord, you have spoke loudly and clearly for my whole life when you laid down your life on the cross. For me, you're in love with me. Therefore, if you're remaining silent right now, to allow me to learn the lingua franca, the language of eternity. I trust you. Gang, I can't express to you how important it is to do what Jesus said. Do this in remembrance of me. And we have opportunities here constantly. Take advantage of them. Make sure you're at the table of the Lord. How often? I can't answer that for you. That's between you and him. But when you're bobbing around, wondering what's going on, God, are you there? Come to the table. Jesus said, remember me, and you will then know that I remember you. Very important. The Lord remembered Noah. And God made, verse 1 goes on to say, a wind to pass over the earth. The word wind there for you students is ruach, which is also what? Spirit. Interesting. God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters assuaged. The world was covered with water and the wind or the spirit moves across the water. Does that ring a bell in your memory? How about Genesis chapter 1, verse 2? In the first creation, when the spirit of God moved across what? The face of the waters. And now I see, of course, the water always in the scripture is a picture, a type linked to the word. The spirit moves across the water and now things begin to surface again. Things come into view once more. Yes, I remember you at the table and Lord, I see you move on the pages of the word. And the fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped. The rain from heaven was restrained. And the waters returned from off the earth continually. And after the end of the 150 days, the waters abated. 190 days in totality now, and the waters are abating, you see. And, verse 4, I love this, the ark rested in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, upon Mount Ararat. Mountain of evidence, we rest on in our Salvation on this good ship salvation that we're sailing to heaven on. What took place on the 17th day of the seventh month? On the 17th day of the seventh month, what took place? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. On the 14th day of the seventh month was what? Passover. The seventh month would be changed to the first month. Exodus 12 tells us the story. 
But the 14th day of the first month, Exodus 12, which was the seventh month back at this time, the lamb was slain. The Passover lamb was killed. The very day that Christ was killed was the day when the Passover lamb was killed in Israel, you see, yearly, annually. 14th day, 17th day, three days later, boom, Jesus rose from the dead. And we rest on the mountain of the resurrection. We rest on that fact. And the ark rested. The mountaintop experience. The ark rested when? On the day of resurrection. It was Easter Sunday, if you would. That's the day when the ark rested there on Mount Ararat. And the waters decreased continually, verse 5, until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were now seen. At the end of 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark which he made, sent forth a raven, and the raven went to and fro until the waters were dried up from off the earth. He sent forth a dove to see if the waters were abated, but the dove, verse 9, found no rest for the sole of her foot, and she returned unto him into the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth." Then, verse 9 tells you and me, he put forth his hand and took the dove and pulled her in unto him. It's a hugely important study. The raven, symbolic of evil, going to and fro, destroying, devouring the devil. The dove, emblematic of the Holy Ghost. And Noah reached out his hand, not just passively waiting for the landing of the dove, but reaching out his hand and drawing the dove in unto him. We talked about reaching out with the hand of faith that you might be empowered by the Holy Ghost in these last days in which we're living. Do you want to be empowered by the Holy Spirit in these last days? Of course you do. Noah shows us the way. Reach out and take hold of the Spirit. As he mentioned, Pastor John does explain this more fully in a teaching entitled, reach out and touch the one. You can hear the teaching on the Searchlight website at johncorson.com. We have one more day left in this verse-by-verse teaching through Genesis chapters 7 and 8. Please join us next time as Pastor John gives us more insight into how this story of Noah relates to us. If you would like to have this complete teaching, you may order one from our website at johncorson.com. You may also call us toll-free at 888-544-4858 and ask for the teaching from today's date. Again, that ordering number is 888-544-4858. You will also find on our website a variety of Pastor John's books, teaching packets, MP3 CDs, and other Bible study resources. Again, the address of the website is johncorson.com. That's J-O-N-C-O-U-R-S-O-N dot com. Searchlight is a listener-supported ministry. We appreciate your prayers and support. May the Lord richly bless you.